I used to be ashamed of my past and unsure if I'd make it to where I was going, but I knew one thing was for certain. We don't end up where we're going on accident. I've also learned that we can't erase the past or hide from it, but we can learn from it and pass it on to others. So who am I? I'm the definition of a bootstrap girl, someone who's made the hard choices to pick themselves back up and make something of themselves. And I'm not the only one. My name is Denisha. I'm a mom, a wife, a professor, advocate, queen of my own path, my who's overcome care abuse, so foster care, gr- homelessness, and raising five siblings on my own at the age of 24. And eventually I got a PhD, but something that I learned is that I don't know everything. So here on my show, we're gonna be bringing in people who know the things that we don't know. Let's get in and learn on the Dr. Denisha Keating Show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dr. Denisha Keating Show. Super excited to have my friend Anna here. Uh, We have known each other for probably over a year now through the foster care community and we don't have any fear of talking about real life stuff. So today we're gonna just talk about whatever comes to mind. Um, And we we pre-talked about a couple topics but I wanna keep that open for her uh, just to kind of talk with what she would like to talk about today and what's on her heart. So Anna, I'm gonna have you introduce yourself, tell us about yourself, whatever you're comfortable sharing, uh, and then we'll just dig in. Sounds good. Um, my name is Anna Bernacki. I am an adoptee. I was adopted at a very young age. I was a, in my adoptive home by the age of six weeks old. So very young. Um, and then I grew up in a very conservative Christian home. I went to college lived the single life through all my 20s, <laughs> got married at the end of my 20s, almost 30. I've been married almost 10 years now, and we became foster parents um, seven years ago, I think, almost eight years now. We became foster parents, and then we ended up adopting four of our five placements. So that looked very different than what I thought it would. I thought we would have 20, 30 placements, and you know, it just right. God had a different plan for us. So. Yeah, it's been really cool. When it comes to, I I mean, there is a huge stigma between adoption, foster to adopt. Can you tell us a little bit about what it means when someone is in the eligibility of foster to adopt and why every foster youth is not eligible for adoption? So foster to adopt, I think, is definitely misunderstood. you should never enter foster, enter foster care as a foster parent with uh, the intent to adopt these children. They are always, the goal is to return home. Um, if you are looking to adopt and not do the foster care route and not just foster with the goal of reunification, there are children who have had their parental rights terminated already. And those children are available for adoption. Um, but that's a very different route than traditional foster care. So when you become a foster parent, right. you are your goal is to return those kids back home and to work with the families and make that happen. I like that you said it just pretty straightforward because I think sometimes we try to overcomplicate it and go into too much detail and some people are like, well, what's the difference? But you know, you made it very, very clear. If there is a child that is ready for adoption from the foster care system, it's because they're no longer, like the parental rights have been, like the parents have said like, hey, we're, there's just, this isn't happening. Or the system said, hey, this is just not gonna happen. Um, Now, when it comes to your experience with you said you were adopted and you adopted what how how different was that because that you're seeing both sides of the the same coin in a very very unique way Uh, i know i did foster care myself and then i was a guardian but it was like oh my god i had no idea that this is what it was like from the parent side so from the adoption parent side and being adopted what was that like what were some of the differences or similarities Um, and some of the fears, whatever you want to share. So I think for me, it was very, I was very sheltered growing up. I didn't know other adoptees. I kind of knew what was told to me about my story. Um, whatever, however accurate or not accurate that was. I mean, back in the eighties, the documentation of adoptions is absolutely horrific. There's a lot of things that were very documented, very false, whether it's an accident or intentional on, you know, one of the biological parents' sides, who knows. Um, But 
in going through my adoption, I just didn't know that adoption was trauma. I didn't understand. I had a lot of feelings, right? Like a lot of feelings growing up, but I always associated it with, well, when I meet my biological mom, everything will be fixed. When I am old enough to see my biological family, then I'll see that I belong and everything will be wonderful. Um, and that was not the case for me. I longed for that for so long. I mean, I remember laying in bed at night, just dreaming and creating these like imaginary scenarios in my yeah. mind of how that would be and what that reunion would look like. And it wasn't that at all. It was mm. absolutely heartbreaking because I played it up so much in my mind. And yeah. then meeting my biological mom and seeing like there was zero connection there, like none mm. at all, which was weird. It wasn't even just a minimal connection. There was just nothing there. Um, and it actually became quite toxic very quickly. And I ended up having to cut ties. Mm. And I do regret, like I was very young at the time. I was like 20, 21. And I have a lot of regrets of how I cut those ties. I wish I could go back and do it again. Um, but I have never regretted actually like the outcome of it. It was very yeah. necessary for my mental health and how, like, even just my own growth and development from there. Um, yeah. But after that, I really became obsessed with having my own biological children. Like, that mm -hmm. was going to solve all of my problems then. Mm -hmm. um, and then that didn't happen. And so my husband and I went through fertility treatments. And while we were doing that, we decided to do foster care. And I will admit fully, we were naive at the time and we mm. thought, oh, we will just adopt from foster care. Um, that was, I mean, within the first few weeks of our first placement, I could see these kids and how much they loved their biological parents and how much they adored yeah. them. And that went out the window immediately. We were like, <laughs> we cannot we cannot just say we're going to adopt these kids and foster right, to adopt. Right. It just became very evident that that was very, very wrong. Um, and I fully admit that because I don't want to sit here and look like, oh, well, she's got it all together and perfect. No, I started with that very false narrative of the foster to adopt. And I learned very quickly. So I think that's something that there needs to be that mind shift within yeah. prospective foster parents that... And you said something key though you said i'm very honest about this and i'm like i'm taking notes because i'm a note taker <laughs> and then it helps me not like because i'll go a thousand different directions and we'll end up on the topic of cows and <laughs> it's really weird <laughs> that's just how life is sometimes but it, i don't know why i said that <laughs> anyway so <laughs> this is why i take notes <laughs> but you said the key i had to be very honest about this and it wasn't just honest of like your expectation for fostering, but also you said something else that you're like, well, and then this will fix it. Having a relationship with my mom will fix my emotions or my life. And then, okay, having a baby will fix, not, not that having a baby, but having my own biological children will, will correct the wrong of what I went through because then I will be a good mom. And like you, you had to get to this hurt. It's so painful to get to this moment. I don't feel like some people understand that getting to the point of like understanding like this is not going to be fixed by that situation or that person and I mean like I don't know about you I was angry I was angry for a long time <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like miss bitter and like jaded and like there's no good parents out there every parent has a dirty secret and every dad is a bad dad and every mom sucks and then it was like, oh, no, 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 just mine. <laughs> like, oh, there's others out there like that. But you, you have to get to that moment, which is so hard to get to, of replacing what, what I went through with something else is not going to work. Because we do see people right. who maybe they go down the eating route where they just eat all the time or they sleep all the time or they work out all the time. Like that could be a very big addiction. But then there are people, we don't talk about these other ones where it's like, our addiction becomes like acceptance from somebody else. Right. So how did you start dealing with like, okay, I can't just replace my hurt with this thing it's, that'll fix it. It's not gonna be fixed that way. And how did you move toward true, real healing? So I think that was definitely a long process. 
once we started fostering, I mean, I loved these kids immediately and it was not, it was not an easy ride. It was extremely difficult. And we were hit with some very harsh realities immediately. Um, my husband and I looked at each other like, what are we doing? And we actually took it older kids. Um, mm. So our very first placement was a teen mom. So that was a very rude awakening. And I had never been a mom before. And here I am mm. trying to teach a 15 year old who already doesn't want to hear it, how to right. be a mother. And it was, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's was... never that's never a good thing for any. It doesn't matter what your age is, but when someone else is trying to mom you on how to mom, you're just like, what? Yeah, <laughs> like, hold up, hold up, right? Hold up, and that's just that's just reality. <laughs> it is, it is, and she needed that help and guidance. But I also was not trauma informed, and I could mm. go on a whole tangent about how what a disservice it is to the foster care system that they don't can teach you, that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, well, I mean, if that's where we go, that's where we go. But can you tell us what trauma-informed training is and what does that look like compared to not being trauma-informed? Because some people, it has become something that has been mocked of like, oh, I'm trauma-informed. It's like, it's the same thing right now that everyone's like, oh, I have anxiety. And it's like, okay, do you though? Like, trauma-informed, what does that really right. mean? Like, we know what trauma is, and oh my gosh, that's not a trauma. Tell me what trauma-informed is, and what does it look like pre- and post-training? I think that people need to know what that is. Yeah, so I think a trauma-informed is understanding what trauma does to the brain, to the body, mm -hmm. how those responses come out in behaviors, how maybe what we would look at is a tantrum is not a tantrum and it's something right. that their brain is misfiring right, um right. so i think having that train before the training you're looking at everything on a behavioral level you're looking at it from typical kids who have not endured trauma and why would you do that that is so mm. outrageous why you're too old to act like that or that's so irresponsible and who do you think you are and then once you understand how these traumas are affecting the brain and their development and even the responses like body keeps the score right like we can oh God, yeah, talk about that all day long and how their body responds to certain i hate the word triggers but it, it's real um right, right. how it responds to different triggers i think that's another word that's overused but it's <laughs> very much overused. We'll explain in a minute. <laughs> Give us a yeah. second. <laughs> but I think that that was something that once I understood that and I was able to take a step right. back, I was able to look at these kids and say, okay, let's see how we can heal. How can we heal the heart? How can we heal the right. brain? How can we build that connection? Because at the end of the day, these kids had absolutely no reason to trust me except somebody told them to trust me yeah yeah okay so let's let's dig into this a little bit i love this because when what to me i had no okay so i studied psychology trigger <laughs> uh, we're gonna jump on this a little bit triggers <laughs> are, are are it's the same word as people getting exhausted with the word boundaries right now where you're like it's a boundary i don't tell and they're like oh get over yourself I have, and you have heard, we've talked, I think we've joked about this sometimes because we're just like, eh, it's a trigger, and it's a joke, but it's something like, oh, you um, messaged me at four o'clock in the morning, and now I'm triggered all day long, because, and it's like your phone was on silent, <laughs> like, that's not a real, right. that's not a trigger, but, but I want to say this because I, I, I saw something yesterday that I was like, you know what, that actually makes sense to me. What triggers Anna isn't what may trigger Denisha. What triggers right. me might be something when I'm tired and, and I don't trust the person sitting in front of me, but then it's like, I've already experienced a lot of ish before I got to this conversation with Anna. And so now right. what triggers me is that my phone keeps going off. Uh, we, one of the things that has currently happened in our state is that we, we we're in wildfire season and it's, it's not wildfires anymore. It's literally people starting them. That is reality for us. But it is like literally our house, um, we're so far away from all of them, but it's our house is in the middle between like six fires right now. So, so oh, wow. the fire up keeps going off and I'm like, I am starting to get anxious. I could have changed that to now I'm in a conversation with somebody about something totally different. I'm like, mm, you're triggering me. Like you're, you're acting like this. And it's like, 
the person didn't even speak like that that's the where we see people misuse it is like they're just using right. the word as a I don't want to talk to you I don't want to see you in person you're a trigger you're a trigger to me now th- when it comes to a foster youth or someone who has dealt with abuse what can be a, tr- a real trigger for them is someone quickly like raising their hand while they're sitting there. Like this happens in classes all the time where a, um, a teacher might like quickly move something or like scream really loud and the kid's like, oh my God, and like they, they get flustered. I know for me, it's the emergency apps. That's just a little bit more of a like anxiety ridden. Um, people yeah. who quick text where it's like instead of just taking a couple time, a couple minutes to put their message together, it's like, hey, what are you doing? I need to talk to you. Hey, ah, and I'm like, huh, well, what's happening? Like, what, what are we doing? What are we panic texting? What's happening? But then, the, then I saw this thing yesterday that that kind of changed it a little bit for me. That was like, what is a trigger for you is not a trigger for me. And I'm like, oh, dang, okay, so I can't rule out someone else's trigger and say that's not a real trigger, but what I can say is if someone is making a mockery of trigger or, oh, my trauma, I'm hearing that a lot is I was abused and it was like, how, like, oh my God, how? And, And I've literally heard people say things like, well, I wanted this toy and my parents said no. And I'm like, that's not trauma. <laughs> like, that's no. not getting your way. But but trauma, like that that when we are on this side of things and we hear these words, sometimes we're like, you did not just say that that was abuse. You did not just say that right. your parent buying you a car, but it wasn't the color. It and all this other stuff. Like we've seen the videos where we're just kind of sitting like, you did not just say that. Like that one. There's this one video from years ago that I remember. And it was this parent buying this this girl this beautiful car. Like, oh man, I think it was like, I want to say it was like a Mercedes, like a Porsche or something like super fancy. Like it looked fancy. It had like, it was the most upgraded. And you could tell this dad did not have this money. And he literally bought it for her for Christmas. And she goes wow. out and she looks at it and she's like, are you joking me? You expect me to ride this? And he's like, you could see this was not, this was not a fake video. He would like the mom was recording it because they were so excited. They had been saving up the entire year. He took a second job to get this for her. And like you could just see it on his face that he was Christ. And this girl was serious. She was just like, Wow. Oh, oh. But then there was another video that came out, and I was like, Oh, it's the same one. And it because it just looked very similar in the way that they recorded it. And this girl comes out, and it is it is a Honda Civic that's like it was like 2015, 16 that, the, that this video was taken, but it was a like 1990 Honda Civic, like not a nice car by all means, like very old. It didn't look great. And the dad's like, um, baby, like I got this for you. Like, I'm, I know it's not the one that you wanted. And she's crying and she's like, Papa, like, wow, man, like you did this for me. Yeah. And, and she like, well, and she's like, oh, we could fix it up. Like we could paint it. We could do all these things. And the dad's just bawling, and he's like, I know it's not the one you wanted. And the mom's like, well, which one did she want? And it was, like, honestly, a brand-new 2015 car. And she's like, Mom, I'll get that later. And there's two responses to this is that I have literally seen the first girl go, well, my parents were abusive, and, like, they didn't provide for me, and they neglected me. And it was like, no, you just didn't get the car that you wanted. Versus the second right. girl runs around and she's like, do you see how my parents provide for me? Do you see how they try for me? Like, no, it's not the car I wanted, but they did do what they could. And I think that, like, it, it does make me pause for a second and be like, okay, let me hear you. What it, what did you go through? I'm not going to just off to the back be like, eh, that's not, that's not it. But when someone tells me, I, I like, have to watch my face because I'm just like, huh? Like, that's not what um and then you know we see tiktok so when it comes to trauma to the body and the brain tell us a little bit about that because i think when people hear when that like be detailed because i think when people hear like oh you were abused and it it impacted your brain they think like a a brain damage situation but but you're saying like it misfires it does this so explain like what does that mean when it comes to trauma impacting the brain I am certainly no expert in this. So this is just yes, all are. learned things as I've as I've raised and my that's cats. The and the most I've gone important along. thing. Like let's let's yeah. talk about it. You do know. 
You might not yes, have a, a yeah. degree in, in neuroscience, but you have experience that matters. Right. And I might not have all the terminology and language, but that's okay. I, yeah. <laughs> Neither do we. So keep in <laughs> real people <going>. terms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, right. I think for the, as far as the brain misfiring, I think a lot of times it can be simple things like our tone of voice reminds Ooh. them and sends them back to a time where someone was really angry or somebody didn't give them what they needed. And I actually, one of my kids always looks at me and is like, mom, are you mad? I'm like, no, I'm just in a hurry. And so I've had to relearn that my in a hurry, like, okay, let's go, let's get things done. Mm -hmm. In her mind is interpreted as I'm very angry and she completely shuts down. Right, right. So now that hurry up and go <laughs> is completely out the window because now she is shut down, not talking, not responding. Mm, yeah. So we've had to kind of work through some of that stuff of, I need to change my tone to make sure that she understands I'm not mad. I'm not upset. Nobody's mm. getting hurt. If it doesn't, if you don't move fast enough, like we just, we just gotta go. We gotta get in the car. We gotta go. Yeah. Um, so it can be something as simple as that. It can be, um, I mean, one thing that we, to this day, my husband, and I feel so bad about, but we didn't know he walked out, he had a broken belt and he walked out of the room and just snapped it before he threw it in the trash, mm. complete oversight and our kids hit the floor mm. and it was like and just shaking and the repair work yeah. that it took after that it was <clears throat> absolutely horrific it was not at them it was yeah, not yeah. toward nobody was angry we were sitting there watching right. tv like there was no, no context around it that was threatening right. in any way but that sound was all it took so things like that where it doesn't matter what the context is mm. it's how mm. that action is perceived and the brain responds and then also yeah. the body responds too and we saw that like the snap of the belt hit the floor and started shaking and i think that that is very telling how the brain and body work together we can even right. see it right. um going to school you know school can be a really hard place to go and it's hard yeah. to get out of the car it's hard to walk in um we found that with the courthouse we actually chose to do our adoption in yes. a different county than where they came into care so that they would not have to go back to the same courthouse yes and because their body <laughs> okay. remembers going that first day in that courthouse so it's yeah yeah. Yeah. I'm like, my brain is like, oh my gosh, because, I, okay, so for the longest time, I couldn't figure out while it's kind of like, okay, for, for people who might like be like, I don't understand how those things can be triggering. It would be the same thing as some, some people can refer, um, relate to this is once you get pulled over by a cop, like you're like, oh God, <laughs> like it's like you see sirens mm -hmm. and you're like, something bad's happening. Uh, mine is, uh, the white vans and white cars that have county logos on it. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting enough, it's only one county that it does it with. Interesting. And it's the, it's the one that I was taken in. Um, right. And I, I yeah, for a really long sense. time, I was like, why am I okay with, like, you know, I'm not going to give the specific counties, but it's like sure. if, if I was in Los Angeles, it'd be like, Los Angeles County van, like, I can't do it. But if I'm in Orange County, I'm totally fine. And it's it's literally like I would be driving to Disneyland and see those cars and be like, why? Well, why? Well, maybe it was just that day. And then I was back in the county that I was taken in. And sure enough, a uh, complete panic attack. And I was like, what is happening? And it's, it is our body remembers. It's like my mind didn't race yeah. to it, but my body was like, that is not a safe location. That is not a safe car. And, um, you know, when I started accessing my files, uh, I went to one of the police stations that we had to go to. And that instantly, like, I didn't feel panic, but I felt more, a little bit more anxiety, just kind of like, yeah. okay, I'm really nervous, starting to get sick to my stomach. Um, and I'm, I'm 34 years old <laughs> and I was like, wow, that happened when I was 15, 16 years old to, you know, 24 and 26 when I took my siblings in, but, but our body does instantly go into a remembrance of fight or flight. Like this is not yeah. a safe location. This has never been safe for us. 
but what what I hear like someone might be saying as they're listening is like okay so where's the hope for us like healing if we can't look at a car or we can't look at a building without panicking like where's our hope and 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 I do want to talk through like healing because I think that that yeah. that's something that uh, we all experience different at different levels at different extremes um, some of it like I mean I feel like healing for me has has been never ending but it also has been in spurts where I like I'll have like seasons of really good growth and then like have to take a couple years before going back to counseling um so for you like how like tell us more about like the healing aspect because I feel like there literally is that that fear of like oh so there's no hope for me because I will always see these cars in panic I will always be triggered by my triggers I will always fear a sound from my childhood like where what would my hope be in how do I start the healing process uh, what should I know about the healing process and all that fun stuff so I think in relation to my kids and ver and my own story are a little bit different um, because I was so sheltered and I didn't even understand that there was trauma involved with adoption for me I really didn't even my trauma all came back and hit me once we adopted my oldest two wow. and I watched them go through the separation with their parents and through the adoption, it ripped open wounds. I didn't even know I had. Yeah. So we had already had them in our home for a couple of years at that point. So we were starting to learn to build those connections, but it actually really, it stripped me down as a mom. <laughs> so like, mm nothing and it was rough it was really really hard to parent and also be trying to figure out what these what these wounds are that i have why am i feeling this why am i struggling yeah. with this too and what it ended up being at the end of the day is just building those connections with each other obviously lots of therapy <laughs> lots yeah. and lots of therapy but i think once you start building those connections and really speaking the truth the truth mm. is i I am safe. My mm. kids, for them, they are safe. They don't have to worry about being hurt in our home. Yeah. They are, and that's still, like, that's not like, oh, I thought about it, I'm safe, now we never struggle with it again. Right, it's something right, that right. they battle all the time, and it's continuous. Like you said, healing, I don't think you ever arrive. <laughs> it yeah. is just a continuous um it can be a roller coaster but it, it's something that you never arrive to and i think it's really important to also i think if faith is a big part of your story especially with my kids when i had all of this stuff come up and my wounds were ripped open and everything mm. i there were a lot of other factors too but right. i completely walked away from my faith and i was like this mm. is ridiculous i don't need right. this i am being hurt i mean hurt by people in the church i'm being hurt people i was seeking that connection from people who were hurting me and it ended up being just me and my two oldest girls is kind of what it was. It was the three of us at going to therapy, working through our struggles, talking openly. I started doing something each night where I would do one-on-one -on -one time with each of them before bed. So my younger two would go to bed and then I would spend, I said 15 minutes, usually ended up being 30 minutes, an hour or whatever, one-on-one <laughs> um, -on -one with them. And we would just talk through hard things and be very yeah. open. Yeah. And I found that the more open I was about my struggles, right. the more open they would become too. Yeah. And normalizing that struggling is okay. It's yeah. okay to have a hard time. It's okay to miss your biological parents. You can tell me that and I am not offended. I am not threatened by that. I know that your biological parents played a very, very important role in your life because they played an important role in my life and I never even knew them. Mm. So 
if you grew up with them the first half of your childhood, yeah, they're going to have a very important role in your life. Yeah. So I think healing together, really opening those conversations and right. not being afraid to talk about the ugly things on both sides. You know, obviously not yeah. pushing on their side, yes. but being open and transparent as an adult about our struggles, mm. open the door for them to say, oh, okay, it's okay to feel like this. It's okay yeah. to express this and talk about this. And yeah, then also through that, seeking, I mean, after I completely rejected God, he hmm. put me flat on my face <laughs> and that I had nowhere happens. else to turn. And <laughs> yeah, You're like, he always calls us back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and finding that through him and really just finding he was my father. And I don't remember hmm. who it was. I'm trying to remember who it was. I, I'll remember as soon as we're done. But a speaker at a conference. And it always goes like she, that. <laughs> I know, right? I want to give credit where credit's due, but I can't even think of her name right now. Say um, it and we might figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, she always talked about how God is our father. Hmm. And I think missing that biological connection, which is funny because I never cared about my biological father. I never yeah. cared to look for him. I never cared. After my experience with my mom, I never cared, yeah. but having that, and I had a very present adoptive father, so it's not like mm. I was missing the father role, but that having and picturing God as my father. And when I pray saying father and mm. really putting him in that father role was so healing. Yeah. And so I don't even like, I can't even find the words right now. Like it just was yeah. this overwhelming comfort knowing right. that he was my father. And that yeah. was the only relationship that mattered. So you, there, I, I'm glad that we jumped into this cause I was going to bring it up with like the, the trauma around adoption. But I think there, before we get there, cause I want to spend more time on that because that is a bigger conversation that I don't want to just pass through. And these other ones is like, these are a little safer to pass through these <laughs> because we're not <laughs> going to get ripped into, but Hey, whatever gets us viral. Right. Um, so you, <laughs> you said a couple things that, that I think we, we really need to sit on for a second is first off, we were not hurt in a day. So our, our trauma usually is a very long period of time that it has happened. Yeah. But it is something that, like, if you have been hurt 365 days, it's not going to take you one day to heal. It's right. going to take a lot longer than that, especially depending on the degree of the, the trauma, depending on the, the abuse type, depending on, you know, your fight or flight, depending on your, your tools in your belt. Like, right. me today could probably go in and be like, hey, I'm going to punch you in the face because you're, you're hurting me. But me then couldn't, but, but because of the trauma I've experienced, I shut down. So I'm not as strong as I would have hoped today, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I can't have that healing. It just might take two to three times longer to see that like, oh, okay, I, I am just in that way. Like I, I have, it's almost like a, a righteous like anger where it's not like a silly anger where I'm like, hey, you're just getting angry to right. get angry. It's like, no, there's a justice behind why you're so angry with this. But you said this big part. You said, I was seeking connection. And I think, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, she said the, she said the buzzword, church hurt. <laughs> I'm like, let's talk about it. Um, there yeah. is this, this thing that, that can happen called church hurt. And um, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. Most of the time I see it happen, it's not intentional. But what I have found in my own hurt of, of people where I'm like, you are a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you shouldn't behave like that. Um, it really came down for personally for me is that I was seeking for family when most mm. people who attend church is seeking friendship. And, you know, people yeah. call me brother and sister. No, they didn't call me brother. They called me sister. They called me daughter. <laughs> they called me friend. But we call each other like, oh, hey, brother. Hey, sister. And like, I felt like my connections with them were so much deeper. And then I moved to church and then I moved to second church. And I'm like, where did the friendship that we thought, I thought the relationship we had, like we should be spending our birthdays and Christmases together. And I'm like, oh, it hit me this year that I was like, is it possible that some of what I was looking for in that friendship, like I was treating them more like family, like real, like you are my brother, you're my sister, you know, I will fight for you, I'll go to the death for you, I will 
move mountains for you, which I think happens in friendships, but within the what I was actually seeking for was a replacement to what I didn't have from family. And so it was yeah, like, oh, well, then why aren't you inviting me to your kids' stuff? Like, I am your family. Like, I'm your friend. We're best friends. Like, I don't understand. And it wasn't, it was, again, they, they were like, I just didn't think about it. And I'm like, what? what? <laughs> like, like, that's all I think about is for you to be at everything for my kid. And it's it's just different that I was looking for this, this deeper connection that humans can't give. Right. And that's where looking at God and being like, hey, you're this dude up in the heavens and like, peace out, like, what's going on? Like, why won't you give me a good life? Like, why didn't you give me good parents? I think those are all valid questions that we can take to him. And we can be like, God, I'm angry. Like, I'm angry at you for letting this happen. I'm angry that you didn't step in and intervene. Like, we get to bring that to him and he is such a a, a strong enough and good God that he's not going to be like, you, you're mad at me? It's like, no, like, dude, he's like, I know. And I'm mad at it too. And I think right. that, that there is this huge thing that, that we tend to do is we're afraid to be honest. We're afraid to be honest with God. We're afraid to be honest with if we're in a foster care situation. We're afraid to be honest with our friends. Because what, we're, what we fear when we want deeply want this connection, we are afraid of losing what we have. So if I say... Yeah hey, if I was adopted in the situation with with you and your daughters, and I would say, Anna, like, I'm afraid to tell you that I miss my parents. Because what what is that fear on the other side? Isn't that you're going to be hurt and be like, oh, but I'm your mom. It's like, I'm afraid that if I tell you this, you're going to tell me to get out. And that now, now I lose you after I've already lost so much. Right, exactly. And that, that's the deep rooted, like, oh, that's why we're afraid. It's not, I'm afraid of hurting your feelings that we can sit here and talk about it. In my family, and this is something my siblings had, and I have talked about a lot over the last few years, is we always are like really afraid to tell each other how we feel. And when we do, it's it, the reason isn't, I'm, I'm afraid of hurting your feelings, is I'm afraid you're going to respond the way that I'm used to. And that, mm-hmm. that way yeah. that we were in response to if we took something like that to our parents it was like we were locked out of the house we were hit we were yelled at we were screamed at for hours at a time like not not a five minute scream fest like sat down for four or five hours and grilled and yelled at and and like don't you move you can't move from this spot and like just this this so when we whenever we were like oh we're just not gonna they're not gonna go into a five hour thing with that we're just gonna not say anything at all because that was safer but as yeah. we have grown and gotten away from that abuse, we have found and have had moments where they can take things to me and say, hey, I'm, I don't know how you're going to respond to this. And most of the time I'm like, oh my God, it's going to be something so big. And it's never the big thing. It is the little right. thing that comes first. And then it comes yeah. into the big thing. And, and that's when it's like, oh, you're desiring two things right now. You're desiring to be heard And you're desiring to feel connected. And if those two things are missing, you can't ever build trust. But it's something that you said, like, I was seeking connection and didn't even know, like, didn't have interest in seeing who my biological father was, didn't have an absence of a role of a father. But you, there's a difference. This is where all of this comes down to is like, there is a difference between having a role of a father and feeling connected to a father. The same with the mother. Absolutely. There's a difference between the role of a mother. Like, congratulations, you're making me breakfast. But do I feel connected to you? And that right. that I think is where a lot of people struggle with faith is that they're like, I know the role of God, but I don't feel connected to him. Uh, that's where we struggle in relationships. We hear when people like have affairs and things like that, where it's like, well, they were my ro- the role, they fit the role, but I didn't have a connection. And it's just like, okay. So the little ways that you're saying, like building the connection, and I loved that you said this, is the connection piece literally is just take plan for 15 minutes. It'll probably go over that. But ask about their day. Ask about what went well. Ask about things that maybe they're afraid of. And if it goes long, it goes long. And if they say it's fine and then nothing happens, which is really hard for boys um, to to open up on their feelings, and sometimes they don't mm-hmm. have 
an emotion on it. They're just like, I'm fine, and they just ignore it. Some said that's very real with trauma and very real with people right. who go through trauma is that it's dangerous to talk about how we feel. We know this setup. For sure, And so we, yeah. just, we just go, hey, and there's moments and seasons where I, and I know I, I can feel this for myself, is there's seasons where I'm like, that didn't bug me. But it was years later that I'm like, oh, that really does hurt. That doesn't feel good. I didn't like that. I didn't want that. And now we need to talk about it. And they're like, but you said you were fine. I was like, in that moment, I felt okay. Right. But now that I've processed how bad that was, <laughs> like, I, yeah. I'm not okay. And that's okay. And I think that, like you said, it was like, hey, sometimes it's going to be like five minutes. Sometimes it's going to be two minutes. Sometimes it's going to be end up being 30, 45 minutes later. And, and it's never at the time that's convenient for us as the parent. So the right. opening, like, I know so many kids, it's like right before they fall asleep, and I'm like, what, wait, the, what the, how, how did that happen today? Like, why didn't you start with that? And they were just like, they had to get comfortable with knowing that you were safe right? First. And And not that you're safe, and someone said this to me, and I was like, oh my God, that makes sense. It's not saying, hey, this isn't a safe person. It is where, like, you're, as you're telling someone something, you're reading their body language. You're reading, are they, mm -hmm. are they listening? Are they distracted? Okay, right. so I'm telling you little by little to see how much you're invested before I tell you the real thing that's on my heart. And that, like, that kind of shook me because I'm like, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. Like, heck yeah. Um, okay, so now I, I want to I jump into the trauma around adoption because, I, again, people have, I don't think people really understand why trauma exists because you were adopted. I think that there are some people out there who are like, oh my god, okay. Like, I've seen it. I've seen it in comments when adoptees have tried to share. I see it in families when adoptees try to share. So tell me, what does it mean when you say there is trauma around adoption? I mean, I think at its very core, we look at, I mean, you're being removed from your biological parents. If you, I saw a quote the other day that said if you walk into a NICU and you mixed up all the babies and said just go home with whatever baby you want mm -hmm. they would be absolutely people would lose their minds I need my right, baby right, right. Like, like I need to connect with my baby <laughs> I'd be like mother but with adoption <laughs> oh it's fine just connect with them you'll be fine mm -hmm. and the reality is is it's it's not fine and no, right right adoption is a solution to a problem it is not if we could eliminate the problems <laughs> then adoption wouldn't need to exist unfortunately mm -hmm. we live in a world where it does need to exist right. so we have to look at it at, at its core and say okay this is a child whatever age it is whether that baby was held by the biological mother after birth or taken immediately it doesn't matter you're being removed from all the familiar smells, the heartbeat, the sound of the voice, everything mm. familiar is an instantly gone. And that will throw anyone for a loop. You take an adult right. and without any warning and have them go live somewhere else, they're going to be like, what's going on? I don't, my yeah. stuff isn't here. I don't like, I don't like this, but with a child it's supposed to be okay. And I <laughs> think, Right. <laughs> like, we talk about it and it's like, oh, this adoption is so beautiful. Can there be beautiful outcomes? Sure. Mm. But in and of itself, it is not beautiful. It is heartbreaking. Yeah. It is devastating. And if we don't start looking at it that way, we're, and I think this was part of my experience was that adoption was so beautiful. And so I don't, it was almost like, glorified I guess mm -hmm. in which I don't want to I don't know it's just I think it was more the time period that I was adopted to that was just more the narrative that right. adoption was so beautiful it was so wonderful God created this beautiful family out of all these other um, mm. biological families and combined them all together and that was really tough for me to hear as a child. And I think it is very dismissive of what right. actually happened to the child. And was I calculating that at the time? No, no. I wasn't calculating but at the time. I wasn't it. sitting there. 
Yes, you, I did you feel felt it. things, and and one of the things you you keep coming back to is connection, and it's like, mm-hmm. okay, we're. I hope this is okay to ask, and if it's not, just tell me. <laughs> but there, there's. From what I've learned from people who are adopted, I used to think like, oh my God, adoption is so beautiful and they bring it in until I knew the first person I knew who, who was adopting. And she informed me, she's like, it's actually a very sad thing. The parent yeah. is very young and they, they want to put her, in, you know, the, their kid into a good a family. And um, we respect that. We understand that. Like we support her for that also because it's like we, we talked to her, we got to know her. But if at any point she says, I don't want to do this anymore, we still want to support her in her life to be successful, which is not what right. you hear in the narrative of adoption most of the time. No. Most of the time it's, what do you mean? <laughs> like, huh, dog, right. don't, don't do that. But she had this understanding and she's like, Denisha, you need to understand. And this was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and she's like, she's being, this daughter is being removed from her mother and put with us. And I'm not, I, lo- I will love her, but but there is a there is a breaking of what is supposed to be exactly. and i was like oh, oh now i'm in my feels like oh i didn't yeah. realize that and she knew that i had at that point had been in foster care and things like that so she's like you were older when you were taken away what did that feel like even though it wasn't a good environment what did that feel like and i'm like dang and so i was like so what are you going to do about it like are you going to inform your kid that she's adopted and she had an open adoption with the parents like to this day um both like she ended up adopting uh two kids and to this day they have a relationship with their bio parents and everything like that and um you know they they understand like they've known uh, we were adopted and and here is what happened um your parents love you uh and we're your second parents and we love you too and it wasn't a what I heard before that was, it was very much like, oh, that was just your your egg donor mom. Like, that was how adoptees yeah. were spoken to. And I was like, oh, God. Like, but what happens when, you know, you're, you're five years old, seven years old, and you're taken into adoption, and it's like, now you don't get to talk about it. When, oh, you find out when you're five years old, 10 years old, 18 years old. And it's like, what do you mean you're not my parents? Like, what the heck? Like... Okay, I've always felt different. And this is what I've heard from friends who've been adopted. Like, I've always felt different. I didn't feel like I fit in. And on, I don't know why parents don't do it on their 18th birthday. Like, that's a rude awakening. Like, how, no. Don't tell your kid for the first time they're adopted on their 18th birthday. No. (laughs) Like, that's not, like, go have fun in adulthood. Like, that kind of feels like in my head, I was like, that kind of feels weird. That it's like, now you're an adult, you get to know this. But I understand that there are some times where it's like, hey, that family's not safe. We want that or whatever. But from my understanding with adoption is that most of the time, if not all the time, the birth certificates are wiped from the parents' biological parents' information. Um, There's no record of them. So if an adoptee wanted to find out who their parents were, it is very hard to do. Yes. yes, and then people go, well, there's blood tests. And it's like, yes, but if that family doesn't do the blood tests, right. it's not in the system. And that's literally what friends have found is like, well, there's nobody in the system on my family. And it's like, <sighs> like, you already are walking around your whole life being like, I'm not, something is different about me and my, from my sibling who, you know, doesn't matter if they're adopted or not. There's just something different about us. Right. And then... It's like, okay, well, you're adopted, and then you can't even get the truth. So what is, I mean, I know it's a solution to our problem right now, but how can we do this better to be able to have this hard conversation with, especially I feel like with those who have adopted, to say, hey, we understand that, like, this is a beautiful thing that you're willing to adopt. It is not a beautiful thing that adoption exists. How right. can we change the narrative to help people understand, like, we're not coming at you to be like, don't adopt, but we're, we're really just saying like, hey, come in with what? What would we want them to come in with an understanding? Same thing with foster care to adopt. Like, hey, don't come to, don't come fostering to say, I'm going to adopt you when that child's not eligible. Like, same thing with adoption. What would be that thing that we can have people come into? And then I just want you to take it away for whatever you want. Yeah, I think 
the most important thing is it's not about getting a baby for yourself or mm -hmm. getting a child for yourself. That is the biggest thing. Yes. Um, because when we look at adoption as a whole, it's these prospective parents, whether they're doing it through foster care or they're going out and spending tens of thousands of dollars to right. adopt that baby, it is, it's not your baby. It is someone mm. else's baby. And it's illegal to purchase children. I think we would all agree on that, but yet yeah. we're going to go out and say, oh, that's, that's mine now. I, I for a couple ten, or tens of thousand dollars, I'm going to, that's what, that one's mine. And I think, I mean, do I call my kids mine? Absolutely. They're my kids. But I also think we need to go into it looking at, okay, how can I assist this family as a whole? Is part of assisting the family adopting? Awesome. Great. But then keep that open. Keep those open communications. Like for me, it was completely closed adoption. And a lot of that was just the time period. It just open adoption wasn't really right, a thing right. then. Um, so I'm glad that that part has changed and it has become a lot more common, but I think if you're, and also if you're going to promise something, you keep your promise with those mm. parents. And I think there needs to be more of a legal implication on the adoptive parents if they do not keep their word on keeping the adoptions open. What about, okay, so keeping adoption open, cause that is happening. I didn't know that. I thought like. So explain that. What What do you mean? Like, if I, if I think open adoption, I'm like, okay, what is it? That means that the parents still have access to the child. What do you mean that parents aren't following that? Like the, so, the adoptive family. So as far as I know, and I could be wrong on this, I don't know of any states where it's legally binding. So an open adoption just means that adoptive parents and biological parents can exchange information, and mm. that can be set up however it looks or however that communication wants to happen. However, at this point, adoptive parents have all the rights. Mm. And biological parents don't have any. So if there's an agreement like, hey, we'll exchange pictures once a month and visit twice a year, if that's an agreement, the adoptive parents can walk away from that and never do a single thing and they won't get in trouble for mm. it. Like that's, it just is what mm. it is. So I think if there now is that, an agreement. Yeah. But what about, okay, this kind of goes into the other part of adoptive families, adopting a child and giving the child back. What about that? Oh, don't even get me started on that one. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about <laughs> I it. I know. Like, <sighs> yeah. It, and I'm, I'm not just trying to, I'm not just be like, we're going to talk about everything. But there is that reality, too, is that there are people who are being adopted and, and saying, okay, you're going to have an open adoption with your family. And then they're saying, okay, we're not going to keep schedules. We're not even going to have you see them. We've changed our mind. We're not going to go close adoption. But that was what the agreement was. Right. Then you have situations where someone is adopted and it is, we are committed, this adoption literally is, we are committed to loving you, raising you as our own until we can't do that anymore when you're an adult. That That's the agreement. But then you have situations where adoptees are being taken back and they're dissolving the adoption and saying, we're no longer going to have you. That, that there should be ramifications for that. You know, Absolutely, because this, is, this be. is not, like you said kind of earlier, like, oh, I'm going to pick that kid and pick that kid and then I'm going to walk away. And it's like, that's not what adoption should be like. That's not right. What, that's not what adoption is. Adoption is the and both that it's like, I am adopting you. And this is, this is not as rosy and, and rainbowy as I would love it to be. It is hard and a beautiful thing that I, I, I have the means to step in, but you are losing part of who you are if I don't bring that part with us and I think that, that's the hard part when you think of adoption like you don't understand that you're just like wait what do you mean that you didn't get to see your aunts and uncles what do you mean you don't know who your mom and dad is like your parents didn't keep track and it's like it's 2024 and I know people in the last 10 years who were adopted and they're 10 years old now and the family goes we don't know who the parents are now that was a choice on the bio oh. family. We understand oh, that. Oh, okay. That but makes, but that makes more sense. I do believe that for the purpose of the child, like it is my responsibility as the parent to be like, okay, 
I want to find that information for you. And I'll do anything in my power when the time comes to help you get those answers. I'm not going to go, well, you don't need to do that. It's like, here's what we do know about your your bio family. Um, It might not be a lot of information, but it's like, this is what we know. But we are willing to help you find who they are. And it not be a sting at you as the parent. (laughs) Because it's not. Right. But, But to say, like hey, I've adopted you and now I don't, I want to dissolve the adoption or I am not going to uphold an open adoption or I'm not going to uphold helping you get the information or or we have seen adoptees come out and say, hey, I was actually abused by my adoptive family Mm -hmm. and then cut off because I said I was adopted. Like, I've seen it and I'm like, oh my God. Like I know. That's heartbreaking because it's like you're just looking for answers and you can't ask the questions. So how do we right. make that better? How can we approach that? I mean, obviously, the entire adopt child welfare system, let's even go back to the whole child welfare system, needs to be completely <laughs> yes. scratched and start over. Like, I, I think we can all agree I on would, that. I wouldn't scratch it and start over. I would say, like, we need to first put something in place first, then well, to yes. switch over. Because a lot of people here, like, dismantle it and then start back up. And I'm like, but what about the kids who need it still? Oh, yeah. No, and I'm we, not. We need to yeah, hurt. And that's not that. what she's saying. That's why I'm like, I know I can say this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what we're saying is, like, we need to fix it. But in the current state right. it's in, we, it's, there's no good. We need to implement something that would be good and then take away what's bad. Um, which is right. a whole uphill battle. But we will fight the good fight. <laughs> we are trying. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Continue, sorry. And I think no, you're fine. I think that it's super important to listen to people with lived experience. Yes. I'm sorry, these people sitting in the office who have these degrees, good for them, but they don't understand and they don't get how all of these different things impact the child. And at the end of the day, it is not about the foster parent, it is not about the adoptive parent, right. it is not about anyone but these children what is best for the children. And Mm. so I think, first of all, we need to get that straight, get that part straight. And then secondly, yes, it is. I remember going to court the first few times as a foster parent. I'm like, they never even mentioned the kids' names. Yeah. They're not even mentioned in this court. The focus currently is the parent, the foster parent, or the CPS workers, and it has nothing to do with the actual child. And people are like, but that's right. the whole focus of what we do. And it's like, but our focus is not actually the child. Like, what's their name? And they're like, uh, where, when was the last meeting you had? And uh, let me get my file. And it's like, look, I know right. you're overwhelmed, but we have to talk about this. Like, what is best for the child? You don't know because you never talk to the child. Right. I think in court, it needs to be talked about. How are the kids doing in the mm-hmm. home that they're in? How are they doing during visits? Do they enjoy the visits? Are they hard to go to? Are like, how can we make this better for the child needs to be discussed? Right, and it right. just isn't right now. Yeah. And I mean, that's more the foster care side, but I think also on the adoption side too, it's the same. parents need to go through extensive training. Right. These home studies are a joke. Where are your fire alarms? Who's going to take care of the kids if you, I mean, I guess that's an important thing. If you die, who's going to take the kids? <laughs> well, that's that important. was important. But <laughs> Keep that one. Actually, that was important. <laughs> and fire extinguishers are important, but. but sure. What, yeah. Keep going. But we're don't, not. Don't ta- keep going. Yeah. Yeah, but we're not talking about, hey, let's talk about the reality of the trauma that these kids have endured. Right and will endure during the separation. Are you prepared for it? Are you committed to walking through it with them for life? I mean, we are going through something in our family that I have had a psychiatrist look at me and say, you need to dissolve this adoption because that's going to be the only way it gets better for your family. And I looked at him and said, you're fired. Like, absolutely not. How is that better? Because they're not thinking about the child, thinking about our family. Okay, and it comes back. And yeah, sure, on paper, absolutely. Yeah, I can see that. Mm. But we're not thinking about the whole. We're not looking at the child and the trauma that they've been through and the whys behind what is happening and how can we heal that? How can we help the child instead of just "Mm, send them back? It's, 
and it's awful that even psychiatrists are, I mean, obviously this is just one, <laughs> one psychiatrist, but that that was even suggested is disgusting to because me. Because we hear it, we've also heard it from caseworkers, judges, police sure. officers, like it's, it's everybody who's just like, oh, this isn't working for you. Okay. And I'm going to say this and it's, I'm going to say it. We care more for animal adoption than we yes. do for child adoption. Like, Truly. I, I don't even think that needs to be explained, but I know the internet sucks. There are more people who are like, you cannot just adopt a dog and give them back. That's not fair to the dog. And I've seen people go on outcries for it. And then you hear that someone says, well, the adoption was dissolved. And it's like, well, you just... There was just so much, and it, it was just so hard. And people are like, no, it makes yeah. sense. I understand. No, we support you. And I'm like, y'all, I get it. I get it when, when there's some things happening, like this person's physical, and like, but that dog was physical too. Like, right. why, 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 why is somebody else getting shamed for, mis like for placing their dog somewhere more right. than someone who's misplacing a child because it got hard? Like, that's part of right. this. And that's our whole point is yeah. adoption is actually hard because there is trauma that still exists. And I was not adopted, but I have had some drama. And I'm like, right. I was not the most pleasant at points. And I, I'm like, man, I'm really thankful for the people who said, we're going to stick it out with you. We're going to love you regardless of your tantrum right now. We're going to love you besides the fact that you don't listen to us. We're going to love you and just kind of bite our tongue for a second when you said, hey, I think this really sucks. It's like I tried to tell you, but I'm also going to love you when you get physical with me. And and maybe it's right. a, okay, we still are adopting you, but you're not in the home right now because it's better for right. you to have your own apartment because there's some things you're physically needing to work through. That's different. But to say, let's just dissolve it because that fixes everything. It's like you would literally not want to do that with a dog, but you're going to do that right. with a child. That, that's what right. baffled me. It's... And, like, I have struggled with that thought for so long, and I have not said anything about it. But I'm like, it, we need to be honest. Both, like, I, I see and understand where people are coming for with animals. Like, you should never get an animal and then be like, okay, well, now we can't have it. Like, unless it's excruciating and situation happening. Right. But then to be okay. But it, it's like, how are you then okay with this happening to a child, a teenager, a young adult, where it's like, I know someone who had their, their adoption and dissolved when they were in their thirties. And it was like, what? yeah, That's they were insane. just like, we just, it was a way to disown this person. And it was like, that is disgusting. Are you kidding me? And it was really to say, I'm going to hit you where it hurts. And that's where you're already experiencing trauma. And then I cannot imagine what that's like to then be like, okay, now we're no longer your family. Because that's what you're really saying. Like, you're not just saying, like, hey, we're dissolving right. the adoption because you're emancipating yourself so that we... It's like you are literally saying, I'm not a part of this family anymore when you do that. Right, you're rejecting them and throwing them, yeah, to like nothing. garbage. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, okay, so let's fix it. <laughs> so what with, with... I love that you said... And that therapist was fired. <laughs> like, no, you are not part yes. of this team because that no. is not that conversation. I never want your kid to hear that. But what what would be, you the, you said it, you said the solution is the trauma-informed training because it's like there's something happening below that we can see and hear and know. So what would that look right. like? on Like if you were to say like, okay, I'm going to walk someone new through this. Um what would be the first step to get them into proper trauma-informed training and not BS trauma-informed training, trauma-informed, trauma proper <laughs> trauma-informed training? I, this is when I try to throw curse words in and the Lord's like, <laughs> 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 go ahead. <laughs> I think it's really important to be honest. I think there's a lot of things that we don't want to talk about. Mm. We don't want to talk about the hard we don't, right. mental health is just not talked about. It, I mean, it's getting better, but it's still right. the ugly, ugly sides of it. We don't talk about. And, and I understand there's this whole, like, I want to protect my child. I don't want people right. to have a bad view on them, but also mm. parents need to understand that this can happen. I grew up in an adoptive family. 
I have been around adoption my entire life and I did not realize that the, it could get this bad. Yeah. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. I have been thrown to, into it. And mm. having some of that knowledge ahead of time would have been so tremendous. How do we yeah. navigate the system? How do we access the help that is there? How do we find the treatments? How do we find, because they exist, but it's getting right. qualified for them or who's right. going to pay for it and how is that right. going to happen? So above and beyond, yes, trauma care needs to be a part of the licensing process or the adoption process, but also access to yeah. resources. Where are these things? Because it's real resources it's not easy to real be resources. Honest? Yes. Because there's tons of thousands of lists out there that I can Google and be like resource that I'm supposed to qualify for. Sure. Uh, yeah. And they don't. And not a single one. <laughs> and you're just like, right. you're like we don't right. help you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's not helpful. Like real resources that actually exist for this family. Because that, that would save hours upon hours for you not to have to dig through. 100%. And we have a huge privilege because my child is adopted and not on uh, the state insurance anymore mm. and they're on our private insurance that opened a whole world of options Better. that did not exist yes and that is sad that should not be the case and can, can you can you share a difference between because I, I think people need to understand this what it what is it like using a resource that is county supervised versus private practice through your insurance what are the different county supervised well wait lists quality of care um i think county supervised they're just not or state county or state it doesn't really matter either one they're not paid appropriately so you kind of get the bottom of the barrel i'm sure there are some very quality services out there and people who are in it for the right reasons they but i are, think and they're more expensive as a whole through the county they're more expensive right. through the county so to get something as affordable whole, is not. And then as a whole, what right. are you going to say? As a whole, it is very disservice. Like when we mm. were foster parents, there was one pediatrician within driving distance, like a reasonable driving distance that we could mm. go to. And I hated her. Like she was awful. The day we adopted, I was like, you're out. <laughs> like we pulled the records and yeah. switched because it was so like she was just awful mm. and so i think it's it's not right like we're treating these kids as like well here here are the services but there really aren't and even if you find the right service yeah. and it's affordable and now yeah. you're on a three-year wait list so yeah. good luck that was shocking okay so <laughs> So my, my, one of my brother, well, my youngest brother was, uh, he aged out in 2021 It's 2024. Okay. We just now got his issues with the state insurance fixed. We think. I believe it. I have hundred percent. Yeah. But I could go literally through like my employee, um, employee, when I was working with employees, uh, sorry, when I was working with employers, I could get health insurance and get him on right away. Um, but because he's 21, uh, they luckily, because I had guardianship paperwork, they finally made the exception. But at first they weren't cause they were like, well, it's not adoption. And I'm like, look, it's the same thing through guardianship. Like it's just, right. it's, it's yeah. the same thing, but it was such a struggle trying to the last three years get his medical oh stuff fixed. And he's like, what am I supposed to do? And luckily we live around a couple of hospitals that'll, that'll take people without insur insurance and they do it through the city. So it's like a city oh, okay. program that they have. But it was like, well, he has asthma. Like, we need to take care of this. And it's just like, sorry, you don't have insurance. It's like, or no, no. Or like, you could just properly file this instead of having it tied to my name. Because once here in my state, once they age out, they put them on their own insurance application so that way they can just handle it without having us involved anymore, which I'm like, yes. Okay. But they didn't yeah. actually dissolve that. They kept him under me, but it was like sending him correspondence, but then like blocking him from getting his card, but then like 
just a bunch of stuff where it was like little things like the wrong address that he had when he was 12 and I'm like he's been with me since then like and it was stuff like nowhere on our file did we even see that and they're like oh it's just him and I'm like how is it just him I had to call in cancel everything then wait for them to call me for enrollment verification and I'm like sitting here like I'm like oh dear lord save me from cussing this person out because it was just like this is three years and we kept going into the office and I kept showing stuff and they're like no no it's good it's good it's good but then we got on the phone and the county is different than the state we got on the phone with the state and the state was like no this is why it's going wrong and the guy fixed it and I'm like I'm done (laughs) I'm done but again, yeah, private, it's... he can go in after he gets his card three months from then. And I'm like, that, right. it's exhausting. Yeah. And I know why people give it up. Is. I get oh, it. Oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that is so important to understand mm. and be able, and just have the capacity yeah. and understanding to be able to fight that system and yeah. figure that stuff out. Because if you yeah. don't, it's how are these kids going to get the proper care? How are they? Because it's hard enough. Even with everything, we're very privileged we have that. And Mm. even with everything, it was still hours on the phone. I know one day I just filled out 80, I think it was 85 pages of paperwork Mm. to try and get into this one program that wasn't even guaranteed after I filled all that out. It was 85 That's pages. I counted nice. it because I'm like, yes, yes. And so that's how I count with papers. <laughs> I'm like, ah. okay. So it was way too this, much. like my head is hurting for you. Um, and it, I think it might be causing some like just body tension. Cause I'm like, I hate this. Like the system for being this broken. Yeah. And, I, and, and really what it feels like is so many people go, it's broken. Oops. <laughs> I'm like, right. We all no. agree on that. Can yeah. we fix it? So, what? Where can we find hope in 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 that? We need to find the way to push forward. Like, how can we still, like you said, how do we fight the system when maybe we're fighting the system and the system is fighting back with us, and then we got ghosted and or flagged. <laughs> I did uh, for pushing too hard. So, where do we find like the grit to keep going? And to to be the best that we can be for our kids that we get to take in. I think what's really important, and this is something that I am learning as I go and has been really, really hard for me, but is self-care and really Mm. taking care of my own mental health. And I go to therapy religiously every single week and taking care of myself, taking those moments to breathe because I won't have the capacity to handle all of these things if I don't. Mm. I will run myself into the ground. And it's hard for me as a mom, I feel selfish. At first, well, I still do sometimes. I'm like, ooh, this is selfish. You know, if I take this time away, it's time I could be spending with the kids or they need me. And that can, both can be true. They can need you and you need that time too. So how, Am I being a good mom while fighting through it and feeling like I'm hitting a brick wall? Or am I being a better mom stepping away for a little while and then I can tag back in when I'm recharged? I like that. And it's a hard balance and I certainly don't have it all figured out yet. But I truly believe that 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 has been a huge shift in my parenting is really taking care of myself. That self-care at home and then really that hour of therapy every week is religious i do not cancel it for anything i like that is my important time and i can process through those things with whether it's my own adoption we every week i go and she's like what is it today like are we gonna process through (laughs) a hard time with right let's talk (laughs) is it gonna be a hard time with the kids (laughs) or is it going to be going all the way back to my childhood about something it's whatever and we jump all over the place but it's Mm. whatever is on my mind i'm able to get it out i'm able to process it and then i can walk out of there and be a better mom and that has been so crucial for me i don't think a lot of people look at therapy as self-care um, but I think oh, I it is the ultimate do. tool now that I've been in it for for eight months. I've only ever done like the three to six months. And then I'm like, I'm good, bye bye. But now I'm like, oh, we have so much to, to do. Uh, yeah. We have a little more work done now. Um, but 
I, I think that that's super helpful. Um, and I love that you mentioned therapy because I think that that is the one thing that most parents, bio, foster, adoptive, yeah, we just go, that's not in the cards for me. And it's like, how much more would you feel connected and as a better parent if you can deal with some of the things that you're experiencing emotionally and mentally with someone who, Absolutely. who can really be objective and not just... Like your friend who's right. like, yeah, you do it. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. And I'm like, what? what? Right. Or even see things from a different perspective. There have been times I've walked in and I'm just like, oh, this kid, I can't do it anymore. They're driving me crazy. Right. And we can walk it back and kind of figure it out and take a different perspective. And then I can walk out of there and reenter the situation and be like, okay, let's right. try it from this angle. And it's not like it's a magic and it always works, but no. it helps tremendously. And it just being able to talk through those things with someone has been so incredibly beneficial. I, I really love that. All right. So we're coming to our end. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I don't know. I think that I that's great to... to leave on therapy because yeah, there is just, I don't know. Look, look, you could grow, go through so many you know, mom groups, dad groups, Bible studies, I think like you can go through so many different parenting classes, but until you start working through what you're feeling and thinking, and it doesn't have to be your past. It could literally just be what you feel today and think today and the stressors you have, you start to realize like, okay, I have, I have someone from the outside that I can talk to who can give me a different angle here. That's not going to be, you know, biased for me or against me. You know, it's not someone that I feel right. like is overstepping. Like, they're basing it off of what I'm telling them, which could be dangerous, so be honest. Um, right. But I feel, I feel like that is a great way to end. It's like, we don't have all the answers for everything. Adoption is messy. Foster care is messy. Is. Parenting is messy. Yeah. But if we don't start digging into who we are at the core and get connected, we will always try to find things just to replace what we don't have or what we lost. And I think right. that... I'm going to sit with that because that, that is wild. So thank you so much, Anna, for coming and sharing. This has been really insightful, especially into the adoption world. I don't think it's a conversation we're talking about a lot. I think we need to have more conversations yeah. like this. I think we need to have the honest, hard conversation that adoption is built in trauma. Um, yeah, and it is it something is. that, um, it is a very beautiful thing, but it is something we need to go in with eyes wide open and say, thank Absolutely. you for stepping in, but there's more to the story than just that. This is the end of that story. It's lifelong. So thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you. Thank you guys, you if you have any me. questions, please leave them at the bottom and we will answer them. Have a great day.